Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to thank you all for coming today and for, and for tuning in um, again with us. We are continuing our series called Defying Gravity, a life debt free. If you've been here for any of the messages the last uh, six weeks, you'll, you'll know a little bit about what this is. We use this as a title for our series because there really is an intentional gravitational pull into the world by Satan to get us more connected to the world and less connected to God. That's what it's about. Now, it's not that we're supposed to separate ourselves from the world. That is not what Jesus wants. He wants us in the world, but not to get too caught up in it and not to let the things of the world start to control us. And what Satan uses, I don't think it's a surprise to any of us, is he uses material things. We're a very materialistic society, especially in our nation. And he uses those things to, to grab a hold of us, some people would say to enslave us, to handcuff us, to keep us from being able to live the way God wants us to live, and that means to live, to give to those people in need. And so, we've called it debt-free. We know we're debt-free from our sin because of Jesus, but we also get enslaved by the monetary, the physical, the temporal issue of debt as well. We've had several messages on this. Very specifically, we've talked about the discipline it takes to manage our finances in a way that it doesn't hold us back from being all we can be for Jesus. We've also talked about the freedom that we get to experience when we are debt-free, and we're going to talk about that even more in the weeks to come. We've also talked about how we manage our finances is one thing, but it's really how we manage our lives as disciples of Jesus because how we manage our finances is just one piece of discipleship. So as we get discipled by Jesus, we have to know that everything we do in this life comes from our hearts. That's why God wants our hearts more than anything else because when he has us here, then he's able to use us in greater ways out there with others. And last week we talked about spiritual warfare, and that was interesting. I had quite a few reactions to that, responses to that, questions about that. Well, today I've chosen to title this message Universal Insurance, and not only because um, Dave Ramsey talks about universal insurance, and not only because I see some insurance people out there today, I want to ask you to raise your hands or anything, but... Uh, no, it's, uh, it's all good, um, and Dave Ramsey has a lot of good things to say about insurance, but there are different perspectives about the value of insurance, especially what we call universal insurance. And what today's message is really all about is uncovering not just what perspectives we have, but how we got the perspectives we have formed. How has life formed those perspectives? Now, Dave Ramsey has an interesting line. He says that the only reason for insurance is for the big things. Would you agree with that? I mean, seriously, why are you going to pay a lot of money for insurance when what you're paying out for insurance is likely going to be more than even what that appliance might be or whatever it is? And if you have um, enough in your finances, it depends on your financial circumstances, but if you have enough in an emergency fund, you generally stay away from having it insured, so to speak. It all depends on where you're at. Leo and I were talking about it this week. Um, the car that we bought after trading in the Jeep was inexpensive enough that we're going, well, you know, if, if, if I make the mistake in driving it and get in an accident and it totals it, well, we'll just cover that. But now that we've had all these other expenses put into it um, to get it fixed up from mechanical things we didn't know, and now we're starting to contemplate, well, maybe we should go back and put collision insurance on it because it really is a matter of what's the big thing or one of the big things that's going to help us make that decision for that kind of insurance. Temporal insurance, according to Dave Ramsey, is simply this. He says, we need to learn to push the risk of the big things onto banks, onto insurance companies, um, trusting that they're going to handle it and um, it's going to make our lives a whole lot easier. That's the idea, if we just put the big things on them. Well, here's where I want to go with this message, because there's also an eternal insurance that we need that's got to be a part of this equation. 
And I, I, I put it this way. I say it's, it's, we need to learn to push the risk of the big spiritual things onto God and his promises. His promises to cover us for this life and to the next. Now, the big things. As I said, what these big things really determines, uh, really is determined by um, our circumstances in life, but also by our perspective in life. So to help us understand how we get the perspective that we have, I have found three questions that I've been asking people throughout the week to answer, just to kind of get some feedback to see if there's some, um, some help in answering these three questions. So I'm asking you to pull out your bulletin bookmark, if you would, and if you go to the sermon notes section, if you could write these three questions down, I'll put them on the screen for you as well. They're pretty simple questions. The first question is, who made all this? All that you see, all that you see outside, all the trees, all the birds, you, your friends, your neighbors, who made all this? And the second question is, who owns all this? Who really owns everything there is? Now, because I'm pretty insightful about the audience I'm speaking to, I'm pretty sure most of us have the same answer to those first two questions, all right? Most of us have probably said God, but here's it's where it gets a little tricky. Here's a third question. So how do I get any of this? How do I have what I have in life? How does that work? And it's this third question that I want us to focus on this morning because our answer to that question, again, it depends on our perspective, and our perspective depends primi primarily on what voice we're listening to in this life. The way I see it, there are three main voices that we hear in our life that are always constantly talking to us in one way or another. The first voice is what I call the voice of the world. And the voice of the world says you only get what you deserve, right? Isn't that what it says? That's how everything in our, in our society is made up. Anybody here on commission sales, you get what you deserve, right? You go to school where you get graded in the class fairly, what? You get what you deserve, right? That's it. Everything about it is that. You get what you deserve, all right? Well, therefore, if that is your, your only, the only voice you listen to in this life and you believe and you trust, then it means you believe you've earned everything yourself, so it's yours. Another voice that people listen to is what I call the stubborn German voice, and being a Lutheran congregation, I figure that's fair. I grew up listening to this voice, and that was pull yourself up by your bootstraps. How many of you grew up with that being told to you? Or how many of you have said it to others? Come on, be honest now. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do it. Be tough. Right. Well, and what happens with that, you say, hey, if you don't work, you don't eat. Right? So, therefore, i got to do some things to earn from myself, while some things I know are a gift from God, but it depends on me. Right? If I'm a success, I had something to do with it. That's, that's where we go with that. Stubborn Germans. And the third voice is the voice of God. And the voice of God really says just this. It says, I provide for all that you have and all that you need. I made it all. I own it all. And I've given it to you. And what happens when we hear that voice and only that voice over a period of time, like a lifetime, we come out of that going, wow, God made me. And then that means he made me the way he did. He knit me together in my mother's womb for a purpose. That means he, he gave me certain gifts and skills. And so the reason I can have the job that I have to be able to earn the money I earned so I can provide for my family it's God, and he gets all the credit for everything I have. Those are three verses, the world's, those Germans, and God, from our perspective on what the big things in life are. But here's what I want to say about this. You see, no matter what your primary focus is in life, 
at any given moment in life because it switches. Sometimes we focus on the, on the temporal life itself, and we have to, what's happening right now. And then other times we're going to focus on just the eternal life itself, and sometimes that's good and we just do that. But here's the deal. No matter how you answer that third question, you know, whether, whether you say that I've earned it all, or I've earned some of it myself, or I give God all the credit. The biggest thing in life is always ultimately the same, whether your focus is the temporal life or whether your focus is the eternal life. The biggest thing to ensure for in life is what? Death. It is. That's what gets insured for. It's death. Does it get any bigger than that? We all know it's coming. It's got a 100% success ratio so far. So, a temporal focus on insurance. Let's look at that in relationship to the big thing called death. Well, for people, for us, when we just focus on our temporal life and we're trying to cover ourselves till death, we want to be assured that we're covered for all our expenses no matter how long we live in this life, right? I don't want to be a burden to anybody. I don't think any of you want to be a burden to anybody. And, 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 and so that's what we try to do. Dave Ramsey says that, you know, the biggest change, I think, in insurance companies over the past 20, 30 years is long-term care. Because we don't know how we're going to, long we're going to live, but we're living longer. And, and you don't want to be a burden on someone else. In fact, I, I heard a commercial twice just this last week. It's amazing how when I put these messages together, all of a sudden, boom, I because I usually keep the volume on low with the TV on, and I pick up these things. There was a commercial on, I do not remember if it was an insurance company or investment company, probably both, but what it was promoting was, you invest with us, and we will assure you that you will have a check every single month for the rest of your life no longer, no matter how long you live. Now, it sounds great right up front. I'm sure you play with the figures. You can do that with any amount of money, but that's the message that was giving the biggest thing to ensure in this life, in this temporal life, is death. And that's what that's all about. Let's shift to the eternal focus on insurance for that big thing called death. And the purpose of needing that kind of insurance is to be assured that you're covered to get through this life to the next, no matter how you've lived this life. And I say that Very, very specifically, no matter how you've lived this life, because there should not be a single person here that can say, I don't worry about that because I've lived my life perfectly. So we want to be covered, right? So we need insurance. Well, that's what this is all about. Well, the reality is we're all destined to die. Life is short and, and death is sure. And the question that I think is important for us to ask all the time, really, is, am I ready? Am I ready to die? Now, I'm not talking about the salvation ready to die, all right? What I'm talking about is being emotionally ready, being at peace ready. And the answer to that is that depends. (laughs) Guess what it depends on? Perspective. Again, It's all about perspective. It depends on what you believe you've been given in this life and what you believe you've had to earn for yourself in this life. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you what I mean by going back to those three voices again. All right. If we listen to the voice of the world that says, I only get what I deserve, I guarantee you will be scared to death of death. If that's the only voice you hear, And if you're scared of something, what do you try to avoid? Thinking about that something. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to think about there being a supernatural world. You don't want to think about there being a God or a Satan, a heaven, certainly not a hell. At least you try not to. I don't think it's possible not to. And when that reality hits you in the face... I think the best that people who focus only on that um, is they pretend it doesn't bother them. And I want to give you an an example. This last week, another commercial that I saw on TV was quite disturbing. Many of you saw it, I bet. Um, uh, 
Remember President Ronald Reagan? Well, he had a son, has a son named Ron Reagan. How many of you saw a commercial by Ron Reagan this last week? Okay, some of you did. Um, what he was promoting was freedom from religion. He's an atheist. He says, I'm an atheist, and we don't need to have religion mess with any part of our society, our government, anything. And I thought we were pretty good at doing that anyway, <laughs> it seems, when it comes to schools and so forth. But this guy is, is really pushing it. Get on board. That religion needs to be put aside for everything. But here's what he did at the close of his ad. He has a big smile on his face, and he says, Now, many of you know me. He says, I'm Ron Reagan. And you know that I'm a lifelong atheist. But I also want you to know this. I'm not afraid of burning in hell. Big smile on his face. It really gave me chills. I'm just like, wow. Yeah. And I kept thinking of that verse, you know, where it tells us in Philippians, uh, when Jesus comes back, every, every knee is going to bow, and every, gonna con- every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is God. And it made me think about, about him. Like, if he comes back right now, we're going to have believers going, yes, thank you, Jesus. And we're going to have atheists like Ron Reagan going, oh, crap. <laughs> I missed it. Yeah, you did. And there are no second chances. It made me feel really sad for him, but it also made me realize we got work to do. So the second voice, though, the German voice, i got to pull myself up on my bootstraps. How does that affect your emotional response to death? I think it affects it by, it, it, it makes you a little fearful, a little fearful, because people who have that perspective, if that's your only perspective, and I grew up that way, by the way, so I can really relate to this, is you go, yeah, I believe in Jesus, I, I believe all that, but... To, I really messed up, <laughs> you know, or did I do enough? Did, I mean, did I re- was I really the best dad or the best husband I could be and, 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 and so forth? So you think about death, but you do so for the purpose of making sure you've done all you can and then hope that you're covered. And then there's the voice of God, where if we listen to it clearly, he says, I've given you all you need all you need to get through this life and the next and if that's the voice the only voice of those three voices that we listen to and subscribe to then we're going to have a peace when it comes to thinking about death in fact it's going to make us think about death a lot but not in a negative way but in a positive way death as a gift because what happens in death is 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 the sinful life is destroyed and then we live forever where there's no sin there's no pain there's no decay there's no suffering there's no tears i mean that's a glorious glorious thing to think about especially our loved ones who've gone before us in faith and i believe what happens when that's our perspective, when we sing songs like we sang about I live my life for you and I build my life on you? We actually do. And we really want to live our lives giving thanks to God so that other people can come to know Him too. I, I think for the most part, none of these are 100%. Maybe an atheist, a declared atheist, would say, no, uh, number one is it. You're just going to get what you deserve. Eat, drink, and be merry. Get all you can. That's it. But I'm guessing most there's going to be a combo of, of all this kind of stuff, which is why as a pastor I, I, I see people in all stages of, of fear or peace on their deathbed. Um, you see, because as believers in Jesus, it's just really hard. To listen only to the one voice, to the voice of God, isn't it? I mean, just to his voice, we hear so many others that contradict it. And I think the problem is we're not wired that way. For somebody to say, I give you all you need, there's nothing you got to do. How many of you like that? That drives most of us nuts. It goes contrary to how we are physically made, how we are emotionally wired. I believe the hardest thing for us to accept is God's grace. That not only is there nothing we have to do for salvation, there's nothing you can do. And we find that so frustrating. Just tell me what I can do, God. Just just give me a checklist or something. We, we have a control issue. We, we want to control it, but because of our sinful nature, 
We are wired to believe there's something we got to do, even when it comes to our salvation. You know, most of us, somebody told me this last week, most of us would prefer, if we could, uh, that rather than trusting only in God, just give me a checklist. Wouldn't you like a checklist? When, seriously, really, wouldn't you? I'd, I'd carry that around with me all the time. This is my checklist. Ooh, check, check, check. I'm saved. I, I mean, really, to me, that's like, that's so easy. You know what, what's really interesting about that? You know what the fastest growing religion is? It's been for decades now. It's the Islamic religion, the Muslim faith. You want to know why it's the fastest growing? Because they got a checklist. They do. They have a checklist. Every Muslim has a checklist to guarantee them salvation. Here's what it is. It's called the five duties or the five pillars of faith. It's, it's first of all, you need to learn to recite the Shahada by memory. All right? And those words are simply, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. I think I could learn that. I wouldn't believe it, but I could learn the words. And then the second thing I do is that you have to pray five times facing east, where the city of Mecca is, all right? Five times a day, privately, publicly, all right? Sounds pretty good. Oh, they have to give one-fortieth of their income, yeah, to the faith. That beats 10%, doesn't it? They have to fast. This might get tough, but it's only for a month. It's a month, a year during the month of Ramadan. And what you do is you, you, you fast from sunrise to sunset, and, and, and then you gorge throughout the night, I guess. I'm not sure how that works, but you got to do one other thing, though. you got to take a trip. You do. You have to make a pilgrimage to the city of Mecca, but only once in a life. Only once in a life. How easy is that? I mean, seriously. You know? At least you, you, you get a checklist of the things you have to do. Five things. Check, 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 check. I'm going. I'm good. Christianity is so much harder. It's so much more difficult. Because it's the only religion that offers salvation as a gift from God. It's the only religion in the, religion in the world that doesn't have a checklist. For us to do that is so hard for us to accept i'm pretty sure it's a control issue so back to that question am i ready well that depends it depends on the voice you're listening to the voice of the world says you know and the voice of the world the voice of the germans and the voice of god so what i want to do now in closing out this message is I'm going to ask you all to do something really, really hard. I want you to just sit back and give up some control. Can you do that? For like five minutes? Seriously, just five minutes. Give up a little bit of control and just listen. Really listen to the voice of God. I'm going to read five brief sections of Scripture. And you're going to have to listen also because I'm going to read in the New King James and that makes it a little bit harder uh, which is one of the reasons I like it, because I have to really think about it. So here's the voice of God. I read this before in our confession. I'm going to read it again. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. And then I, I pulled another scripture that changed my life. Um, <laughs> I've had my life changed by, I think, the most depressing scripture in the Bible. But it's from the book of Ecclesiastes, beginning with verse 17. God's voice. Through Solomon. Therefore I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me. For all is vanity and the grasping for the wind. And then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. 
Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled, and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. It's also humbling. And then I want to read for you from one of our Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter. Just a few verses. It's a parable that Jesus is talking about to his disciples, beginning with verse 16. And he says this, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, bountifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, ah, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater ones, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, I love this part, I will say to my soul, soul? You have many goods laid up for many years, so take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? All three of these have some commonalities. They all talk about how we never know when we're going to die, we, but we're going to. But they also emphasize this point, our need to be assured that we're covered for eternal life, right? When you read about death in here, which is promised, we need to be assured that we're covered for eternal life. There's plenty of ways to get covered for this life. There are. You can go to all kinds of insurance companies for this life. But there's only one way. There's only one way to know that you're covered for the next. So I want to read for you from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. And this is what he writes. In Christ we have obtained an inheritance being predestined chosen according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be or live to the praise of his glory we've been chosen And he's called us to live to God's glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, listen to this, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Where did that happen? In your baptism. When in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you were marked with the seal and the name of Jesus Christ, being sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say this. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption our redemption the redemption of the purchased possession that's us jesus bought us back from satan and he concludes by saying that means we should live to the praise of his glory So which voice are you listening to? Because the voice of the world is pretty clear. And it has a gravitational pull into the world and and to Satan. And draws us closer to him rather than to God. Because it tells us over and over and over again, you only get what you deserve. The voice of God is just the opposite because it reveals an anti-gravitational pull a pulling away from satan and the world closer to god by telling us as we just heard 
that Jesus, on that cross, he got what you deserved. And we now get what Jesus deserved. Forgiveness. He earned it. Holiness. Because of a perfect life that he lived, he's given that to us. A righteousness. Assurance that we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ for the life to come. The assurance that we will live eternally with God. Now some call this insurance universal life. (laughs) Actually, that's what I call it. (laughs) I'm just taking a simple passage we've all learned since we were kids. God so loved the world. The world. And that's why he gave his one and only son. And if you believe in him, you will not perish. But you will have eternal life. God is not going to give you everything you want in this life. But he did make it all, and he owns it all. And he promises to give you all you need. And he does, in Jesus' name.